I remember from back in 1984 at the, you were at the, at the 84, weren't you? I know you were at 86. Yeah, 84 Tesla Symposium, the very first one. And uh, he's been researching this material for over 30 years now. And he just keeps going. And he's a possessor of degrees in electrical engineering and systems engineering. He's got three books out, Tapping the Zero Point Energy, which I still consider a classic in the field. I'm constantly recommending that book to people. He's also got Quest for Zero Point Energy and New, I wish the trumpets, okay, New, The Energy Machine of T. Henry Moray, which is going to be his topic today. Moray is from Orem, Utah, and he's a software engineer most of the time when he's not doing this research. Here's Moray King. Uh, very quick while Maury's coming up, anybody who has a cell phone or a pager, please uh, put it on silent or turn it off. Thank you. Or we'll put it on the speakerphone. <laughs> so I just got done being zapped by, by Gene Kuntz with the vibration vibe machine, and uh, boy, you're going you're to get it now. <laughs> just, uh, you know, some of my colleagues back at work, they're quite conservative, and they say, why do you go off to those kook conferences? And... Um, Aren't you worried about being corrupted? And, uh, you know, they're always curious about what's going on when I get back. So I think I have the answer for them today. I'll say to them, where else could I get zapped by a vibe machine and then bask in the golden ratios of Flat Pat Flanagan's anti-harp neurofoam? <laughs> I never get a second question. <laughs> um, Actually, it's fitting that I follow Tom Vallone because Tom Vallone was the one that encouraged me to do this, do this talk. I, it was given in his suppression conference two years ago, and, and the T. Henry Morey story is, is a story of suppression. And uh, they didn't ever do a videotape because the speakers were paranoid and didn't want it to happen. Right? Oh, us speakers said, no way. But uh, so we thought we'd do it again in order to get the videotape. Um, I didn't always believe it was possible to tap energy from space. Uh, I was a mild-mannered, well, strike that, I was never mild-mannered. I was just a graduate student. I, I was uh, studying systems engineering, electrical engineering, computers, and that sort of thing, really in artificial intelligence. In 1974, I had the misfortune of reading a book, I think it was called Beyond Earth, it's about UFOs and stuff like that. Read it for fun, like science fiction, but I was very intrigued by the witnesses. They said it could do these hairpin turns, airline pilots were witnessing, police, people that would have everything to lose by reporting such phenomena. And I became convinced that there's something going on and they exhibited this anti-gravity-like propulsion. And I decided at that point I'd start to study gravity. Coincidentally, 1974 is when uh, we had the big um, oil crisis, the lines and the, you know, the gas stations and everything else, and there's a big energy conference. So as I was reading up about everything I could, studying gravity, general relativity, I got that big book by Meisner, Thorne, and Wheeler, Gravitation. And the last two chapters, they mentioned something called zero-point energy. And it was tremendous amounts of energy. It turned out you would need tremendous energies to warp space-time in order to produce propulsion. And they were talking about numbers like 10 to the 93rd grams per cubic centimeter uh, down at the Planck length. It was just extraordinary. And I says, I've never heard of this. Here I was getting, a, I was in the PhD program in systems engineering, and I never heard of it. And it turns out all the professors in the engineering school likewise never heard of it. And I wanted to do my thesis in that, and we'll see why. And uh, so, so I said, uh, this, this was how I wrote the first paper, uh, is anti-gravity possible? I immediately followed up, is artificial gravity possible? It was the work of Townsend Brown. I got invited in 1976 to Chris Bird's house in uh, Washington, D.C., because he had a huge collection on original files from Townsend Brown. And that night, I remember sitting in his living room, and he said to me, there's a kook out in Utah. Doesn't write real well, but he's a, he is a wonderful inventor, and this book is obviously for you. He throws a book in my lap. It's the earlier version of this book, The Sea of Energy in Which the Earth Floats. And when I saw the name of the author, T. Henry Moray, it was like getting hit between the eyes. It was, it was an epiphany. It was, um, the, the, his name spelt like my first name, and I knew that this was a story about 
man who made a, an energy machine that couldn't be explained from the science at that time. And here I was in, in very much involved in zero point energy, no theories and that sort of thing. And I knew that this was to be my life's purpose. I was to help explain the device and help launch the movement. And, and work, coming to a conference like this is wonderful because there are other people here that feel the same way, that, that they too, who, who are here, feels that they're here to help transform the planet, make a better planet. This it happens all the time at these conferences. Well, I love to share my favorite deep thought to you. In my mind's eye, I can visualize a, a world without war, a world that knows only peace. I can see us attacking such a world because they would not be expecting it. <laughs> I think Jack Handy actually speaks the truth with this. Because we need to dissolve the consciousness, consciousness problem to actually safely use the energy that we're about to discover. Back to Moray. Moray didn't just start. He didn't channel the device. He worked very hard as an electrical engineer. He, he systematically developed it. He was a crystal radio hobbyist. He was an enthusiast. He started as a teenager. And the, and the neat thing about the hobby of crystal radios is you work with, you find, try to discover um, the ideal crystal detector material and use a point contact uh, transistor like uh, rectifier. And that's the whole thing on the hobby. You make a nice ground, you make a nice antenna, and he could get surges of power. He, he, found, he made an adjustment in the front end of his crystal set, and he could start to get weekly light up a, a single light bulb. This is an earlier device. Uh, John Moray says the coils were put on to distract people and things like that. But he started out very small, getting very small effects uh, from the technology. But he really believed, he was a Tesla fan, he really believed he was receiving radiant energy or ether waves or something impinging from space. And that was his mindset. And he would work with those ideas to gradually increase the device. Here's a demo uh, where they have a, and it, they, with, he was able to get the antenna smaller. And they actually hold the antenna. And he, the child's holding a load. That's a little motor, electric motor that he, that he made. Uh, he started out with a big antenna and a big ground. And he was gradually finding out he didn't need it. He could gradually shrink it. Here's an example of the loads. Uh, conservatively, we, we light up a light, lots of um, bank of bulbs. And we uh, have a space heater. We have an iron. And we have a motor. And if we conservatively add it up, we'd say that's about 4,500 uh, 4, watts, or, or let's say 5 kilowatts for these demos. Here's a clearer picture of the loads. Um, here's another picture where they're showing the antenna. This Moray is probably the historically the most famous of the free energy inventors because of the witnesses. He has more witnesses, and more testimony uh, than any other invention. All he asked from the witnesses was to write a letter of testimony just describing what they saw. They would do. They would investors would be interested, and they would take the device out into the canyon and away from all power lines, and they could show it wasn't any tricks or anything else hidden batteries or hidden coils. And, uh, it was probably the best of the devices for repeatable demonstration, perhaps in the history of the field. This is a test that was run that was very strange. Um, while the device was running, he could cut the lead between the device and the antenna, uh, and a ball would be lit while the device was running. If the device wasn't involved, the ball wouldn't be lit. He could show it was not just a current being induced between the antenna and the ground. And in the cut, he could insert glass, window glass, panes of glass, and it would, it would conduct through the glass and keep the bulb lighting. And he would invite uh, other people to bring their own glass just to show it's not a trick. And the other strange thing, the currents in the device exhibit were cold. Here he had a uh, five, watt, five kilowatt device, or, or he claimed more, actually. And he would, he would have number 30 wire in the device, and he just would not heat it up. So he had exhibit this cold current effect. And other, other inventors have, have observed this over the years. And to an electrical engineer, this is highly significant. If, if there are 
cold currents, if, if you can conduct appreciable power, this is not normal electron conduction. This is closer to a polarization wave, as we'll see, induced in the vacuum itself, a coherence in the vacuum energy that hugs the wire. Here's the final device. No antenna, no ground. He found he didn't need it. He did tests in an airplane, did tests in a mine shaft, and then even did a submarine test underwater. The, dev the device would run. This, this probably, these tests showed more that it's not the normal electromagnetism that would be impinging on the device from, sp from space. It had to be something else. Another strange discovery that he stumbled upon was the sound pickup device. He was using the same crystal set-like technology with, with headphones and you could tune it, adjust, adjust the point contact on the crystal or tune, slightly tune the device and you would hear people talking. You would hear sounds from miles away. There's a story they could hear sounds from this train station four miles away. The, by the way, he lived right here in Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, this one's tough to explain. Uh, we knew know that the type of technology he was using was the same the type of, of technology to use for infrasound detectors. And also, um, one speculation, it could be an acoustical soliton that keeps its, doesn't disperse but hugs the ground, or some type of ion polarization wave that hugs the ground and channels. So this device is, is hard to explain, and uh, I, I'm still thinking about it. Another unusual discovery was he would find that the electrodes inside the plasma tubes would transmute the heavy metal of the electrodes. And they would be unusual isotopes. And now we actually see this, see this repeated in, in various experiments. We see it in the cold fusion cathodes from those experiments. And Ken's shoulders with his charged cluster strikes can demonstrate it readily and repeatably. So transmutation now is quite repeatable in, in, the, in the experiments by our contemporary inventors. The history of Tom, uh, Thomas Henry Moray, it's a tragedy, the story. He's born at the turn of the century, begins his research as a teenager, and weekly lights up a bulb to half power. He goes on a church mission for the, LD, for La, La LDS church, and there he finds the mysterious Swedish stone. He went on a Sweden mission. Uh, the story goes in some railroad yard. And he brought it home. And this was the, the, the exotic material that he used when he combined it with some radioactive material for his early detector that produced these remarkable results. He, he, he marries and is employed as an electrical engineer. And by 1925, he, uh, the, his device is up to 100 watts. He quits his job and he goes full time into inventing. By the time we hit uh, a few years later, uh, he's about at 600 watts and the Russians are very interested. He has visitors from, from Russia or people representing Russia and encouraging him to leave the United States and do, do his research in, in Russia. This, he, did, he starts the Moray Products Company in 1930. And in 1931, his patent was rejected. Uh, they said, oh, you never heated your cathodes. You know, he's using radioactive coal cathodes. And they just said, well, you have to heat your cathodes to make a power device. They just didn't, didn't believe him. By 1938, that was probably the height of the demos. He was about 4,500 or 5,000 watts. The rural, rural Electrification Agency builds him a laboratory. Now, the Rural Electrification Agency was a group that, that was sanctioned by the government to, to develop energy in the West, build up the grid in, in the Western states of the United States. But they, they were very strange fellows because they, the people that were working there, that were agents for the REA, kept encouraging to leave and go to Russia. So it was later found out by an investigation in Congress that the REA had been infiltrated by communist agents at that time. Um, a particular worker for work that was from the REA, Felix Fraser, became a confidant of Moray and worked with him for about a year. And Moray was disclosing everything to him. And then he's the heavy in the story because at one point, after they run that glass penetration test one last time, he picks up a hammer and smashes the tubes of the device. And everybody was shocked and just leaves. Moray, Moray was, was devastated. Uh, and later on, ooh. Which one would you like? Whoa. Three. Three. Well, 
Can I cross the beams? I, I saw a training video a train that clearly stated it's very dangerous to cross the beams. I think it was called Ghostbusters. Oh, wow, this is great. Toys, I mean, you only one at a time. Okay. All right, I'll use green. I've lost, lost the button. Okay. Oh, great. 1940, he was wounded in a gunfight. There, they, there was a break in his lab. They didn't know he was there. It turns out he's a very good shot with the pistol. He practiced quite a bit. He was, he was quite paranoid because people were taking shots at him. He bulletproofed the car because his family was in danger. He's under threats. Um, and he wounded the people raiding the lab in return. And, and uh, they, they escaped and didn't steal anything. And he thinks it was uh, Felix Fraser and his, and his cronies trying to steal from the lab. 1943, he attempts to rebuild the device, but he burns out the detector. In 1949, more, he receives his only patent his elect for the electrotherapeutic apparatus. We're going to look in details at that patent because there's a surprise. 1950, he gets a classified project to investigate the sound device from radio signal labs, and I don't know how that ended. Uh, in the later years of his life, he was very much into studying transmutation events, and he, he dedicated his studies for transmutation in the, in the tubes, and I noticed he was using some lead material in some of the tubes that was mentioned in the patent for electrodes, and I thought, oh, maybe he's trying to transmute lead into gold. And in 1974, he dies, and that's when I get started. But the project didn't end then. John Moray, uh, as his son, continued to work with uh, Glenn Foster, uh, who, who, I, who I met, and it turns out he was one of the reasons I even got recruited to come out to Utah. What I didn't know at the time, and Glenn finally confessed uh, in the latter years of his life to, to me in a, in a private conversation, that I was brought out to, to do the follow-on for pro this Project X is what they call it, but John Morey did not want to continue the work. But what they did do on Project X, they raised about a million dollars. Most of it went to the Haskin Labs, which is the Air Force Lab, and some of went, uh, the remaining went to Iring Research and Cosray Research. And Iring Research is where uh, the professors could work on classified projects. They built 24 oscillator tubes on the project, and they analyzed the Swedish stone, found out it was diatomaceous earth and quartz. And the diatomaceous earth are like little seashell creatures, the diatomes. And, and Glenn likes to tell a story where they, where they took this uh, material from the Swedish stone and with a little radium doping and they would put it in the mega diamond press here in Salt Lake City and they would just squeeze it down and there was an EMP accident that came off this thing, an electromagnetic pulse that blew out the transformer on the street. So that's how the story goes. But Glenn likes to tell that story. And there was a final report written by John Morey on the project. So what are the big mysteries on the Morey project, on the Morey research? Of course, where does the energy come from? Uh, how, can you how can you have cold currents? How can you uh, conduct appreciable power without heating the wires? How could a sound device possibly work that could hear just acoustical sounds? And how can we get transmutation? I have the advantage uh, by building on the work of what I think are four very significant inventors who have, who have related technologies that, that allow me to piece together what's going on on the Moray device. Paul Brown made a nuclear battery that was very, very simple and could really illustrate the, 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 uh, the basic principle of how to use radioactive material in a, with an oscillator to produce these anomalous effects. The Koreas have studied glow, uh, pulsed anomalous glow discharge tubes in a lot of detail, which I think very much relates. Ed Gray had a similar tube, an electrical conversion switching tube with a different geometry that I think is more powerful. And this is the device, this is, his tube is the one that I recommend for people who want to experiment in, in garages because there's no radioactive material, it's completely safe and has, and has a, a great pedigree, pedigree on other people having somewhat, some success investigating this device. And I think Ken Shoulders per, perhaps has provided the most it, most, de most detailed and, and great information with his high density charge clusters or EVs. He's clearly producing an anomaly repeatable and he's been very open in sharing his research. 
And I think Ken has probably provided the most information as far as what kind of anomalies can come out of these pulse plasma events that occur in the tubes of Moray and, and the other in inventors. For one, he can get transmutation. He can do a single strike with his EV. EV stands for electron volitum or, he, or strong charge. He now changed the name to EVO, exotic vacuum object, because he thinks it's a coherence in the, in the vacuum energy itself. Uh, these are experiments hitting polydium. And one EV strike, and you analyze the crater of, of, around the palladium, you'll find all sorts of transmutation of the metal, uh, and they're unusual isotopes. They're not the type of isotopes that are found in nature, nature. So probably Ken has the simplest and the most straightforward of the transmutation experiments that have been done. The EV is launched on any spark, on any abrupt discharge. It's the precursor. It's the front end of the spark. The trouble is, you erode your tip of your electrode. So what Ken does is he has liquid metal feed here that keeps replenishing the tip. This, these electrodes here suppress the ions and the sheath tries to keep the ions out. That's the remainder of the arc, the plume of the arc. He just wants the front edge is where this microscopic plasmoid or ball lightning like entity on the order of one micron. It has a charge of approximately the equivalent of 10 to the 11th electrons and carries along uh, about a million ions with it. Here's the details of launching uh, an EV. This came from the Russian work, Mesats. He's a big name in Russia. Apparently, he's uh, president of the Academy of Sciences. This is a blow up of the very tip of the cathode that launches the EV. And what happens is liquid metal stock forms just before the emission of the EV. Notice that there's a glow plasma around in the environment, it's highly polarized. And then the tip blows right off, blows off the tip, this abrupt thing. And you can see the wake and the circulation, the compression events in the corona. That circulation produces a vortex ring, a perfect vortex ring. Now, if you study the work of Bostek with plasma filaments, they squeeze down and concentrate energy to a tip. So if you imagine a filament that turns on itself, that's what they produce in the vortex ring. And they can get this because the perfect boundary conditions of the liquid metal allow, allow the, the ring to form up immediately. Uh, the earlier work on any point contact uh, against the dielectric can launch an EV. And that's how he studied him originally. And the point contact is important because Moray was doing a point contact transistor into uh, a corona on his dielectric. Uh, a, a great way to make large EVs is cascade a series of EV launchers together, and each one coherently builds. And this is how Ken makes the centimeter size uh, plasmoids. He says they're very dangerous. If they hit metal, they, they put out an EMP blast. It just fries all the electronic equipment in the laboratory. It just, it just destroys solid state stuff. He doesn't make them because they're just too dangerous to work with. Uh, this, the cascade idea is also a great idea to make a unipolar switch. And we'll get into that when we study the gray tube. It's very important to make an abrupt pulse in one direction into the corona in order to create the, the a activation of the vacuum energy. If you, just, if you have oscillation in the switching, which normally happens on any switching where we switch into an arc, you don't get much of an effect. So if, uh, the advantage of a cascading switch uh, this portion would be quenched by the time this portion fires. So we create a unidirectional flow. So what could the energy source be behind the Moray device? Moray believed he was tapping radiant energy from the environment. And all his engineering, especially in the early years, was dedicated to building a system around that belief. Most of the researchers who studied Moray believe it's nuclear energy because he had a lot of radioactive material he would use in the device. He loved playing with radioactive material, but the problem was it was weak material. Radium, uranium butyr 38, thorium. He didn't really work with anything strong. So the energy density and the, energy and the amount of energy coming off the material was just not quite sufficient to explain the quantity he was getting on the device. Uh, zero point energy is, is, is not quite as popular. I'm the big proponent of that as applying it to the Moray device, but other people got on board. Here, the zero point energy is activated from the plasma. The radioactive material was used to make the plasma. It's more of the catalyst 
and so you don't have to put any energy in to make your corona and then the rest of the system can be used to modulate or engineer that, that plasma and that's what Morey did. He was a master of corona engineering. And of course, any synergistic combination of these ideas can be applied. Now here's an example of a synergistic combination. The ion acoustic oscillations in the plasma can activate the zero point energy which could induce vision in the radioactive material which again could produce more plasma which could repeat the cycle creating a positive feedback loop. Is there energy in the atmosphere? There sure is. There's plenty of it. Oh, we have lightning. We have ground currents. We have the ionosphere. We have the radiation belts. Cosmic rays are keeping everything ionized and, and of course the solar energy from the sun. Whistlers and sweepers are very interesting because they rapidly change their waveform. And Moray's detector and his, and his on his front end was a broadband detector and it was designed to, to, to detect and coherently respond to these types of waveforms. And of course we have the ELF, the extremely low frequency, in the Schumann cavity between the ionosphere and the ground. Well here's your standard crystal radio. Uh, we, have a, we, have a tune, we have a coil, a tuning capacitor to tune into the station, the detector is where the crystal is that detects the, uh, rectifies the amplitude. We, we rectify it on the capacitor, and this is where we, on the headphones, where we listen to the sound. What Moray did was remove this capacitor, giving him a low pass front end, so he could absorb low pass energy uh, across the entire low band, and that's also, removing that capacitor is what they do when they make infrasound detectors. So that's where Moray had his roots. This is an example. He used to attempt from this patent application in 1931. He's attempting to uh, rep, uh, not use the Swedish stone anymore, but make a, a uh, artificially be able to make the equivalent device. He was working with all the materials of the transistor. This is back in the 20s. We have uh, bismuth. We have germanium. We have iron sulfide. And, iron, and the sulfides, both zinc sulfide and iron sulfide, they're luminescent. They produce a plasma on the surface of the material. So you, get, you can get surface plasma on the material. Uh, the germanium he doped with radioactive material, radium, uranium, and thorium. And uh, these three were mentioned by Rutherford uh, at, the, at the turn of the century where it would produce more radioactive activity than any one alone. And Paul Brown, in his patent on the nuclear battery, mentions this combination, and, and three of his ten claims in his patent uh, are claiming this combination that Rutherford discovered. Well, that, it was popular to work with radioactive material. Uh, back in, 19, uh, in the 1930s, McElrath gets a patent for using uh, radioactive coal cathodes. Our own Philo Farnsworth, he's an Idaho, Utah inventor, his famous Fusar device, uh, here's a supporting patent where he was using cold cathode discharge tubes with cup-shaped electrodes where he was concentrating the energy right, right here using, using that, and he would get fusion events. And they studied this in the 50s at BYU. I think Paul Brown, in his claims that the nuclear, nuclear batteries all Moray did, ironically enough, probably did most to prove it was not nuclear power that was the actual source because Paul was working with very weak radioactive material. He was working with uh, Krypton-85 or Strontium-90. He was working with the one Curry source. What I love about his work, electrically, it's extremely simple. It's just an electrical oscillator where the radioactive material is uh, near a, the coil the wire so you have corona around the coil, one of the coils of, of the wire. Uh, if you recognize this diagram, people have done the research, re realize this is a remake of the Hubbard device. Uh, Hubbard was an inventor at the turn of the century and it has, it has a series of coils around, um, around there, the radioactive materials on the inner coil and basically electrically it's still an LC oscillator and Paul Brown probably has the record for doing two, two things historically that, that I think really puts him on the, on the map for history. Number one is he was the first to repeat uh, an inventor, um, on one, a famous inventor, uh, on a self-running device. His device ran continuously for five watts. He would guarantee it for, for five years 
working with very weak radioactive material. His number two accomplishment was he was the closest of anyone in the field to breaching the marketplace with an actual device because he made, he didn't make the sound hokey, he made it sound like it was a simple nuclear battery. And I asked Paul Brown at the 1990 uh, Tesla conference, I said, how many people call you on that? You're talking about a one curry source, uh, Krypton 85. Um, you look it up in the handbook, you realize that can at best produce energy at five milliwatts. You're, you're claiming is 1,000 times over that. And he said, well, you make a good point. The short answer is maybe about one in 100. The engineers pick up on that. He says, but uh, there are two important points. This device was not intended to be a five watt battery. It was intended to be a 100 watt battery. They would have accidents where they would go unstable, surges of power would occur, and it would burn up all the wires. And so, the, so we, we, he could get surges on the order of kilowatts. So what they decided to do, they could stabilize it out at, at five watts and earn money that way by selling it as a five watt nuclear battery. And then later they would do research to, to, uh, to up the energy. The second point was that they were attempting to team with General Electric to, to actually mass produce these batteries. General Electric sent their top gun nuclear physicist in their due diligence to check out Paul Brown and the device. He said that physicist lost sleep for a week. He saw everything, he tore it all apart. He just could not understand where the energy would come from. He, Paul said, well, he told me my theory was full of it. And I just said back to him, well, you're the expert here. If you can come up with a better theory, I'll be glad to hear it. So ironically enough, Paul probably did the most to prove it wasn't nuclear power as the source behind the Moray device, but the nuclear power was to make the plasma. Moving on to zero point energy, it's become quite popular now. Back in the 70s when uh, Tim, Timothy Boyer was the leading proponent of zero point energy uh, in the United States, he wrote a series of papers culminating in prove, to prove that a whole point of view could be done in, in physics and it's called uh, uh, stochastic electrodynamics uh, where all quantum effects arise because of matter's interaction with the background zero point energy. Uh, how put off picked up in the 80s, he showed how the hydrogen atom could be stabilized out of zero point energy. Uh, this is a famous paper politically because he could show that it could be tapped as an energy source without violating thermodynamics, and thus it's a legitimate field of study in physics, the possibility of tapping the vacuum energy as an energy source. He went on to show how gravity could arise from it, and recently a lot of excitement was generated on the inertia paper showing how inertia arises from the zero point energy because it became apparent if you could modulate the zero point energy, get control of it, then you could, you could establish inertial propulsion and get into this UFO-like propulsion drives. The zero point energy is the basis of the uncertainty principle. It's this underlying jitter to everything in, in the fabric of space itself. Pairs that are short lived particles, they call virtual particles, can appear and disappear right out of the fabric of space. It's really being taken seriously now, both string theory and quantum, and quantum gravity, where they have now detailed modeling down at the Planck length, 10 to the minus 33rd centimeter. This is a model of an individual vacuum fluctuation on huge, on very tight time scales. I'm amazed they're, they're going to this detail in their modeling. There's a uh, computer diagram of a single vacuum fluctuation in space down at this scale. What does it look like? Uh, when, you, when you smear it out, they call it the quantum foam. This is the fabric of space. This is derived in, from geometric dynamics uh, by, by Wheeler, John Wheeler. Um, it, he did the work in the 50s and published his book in 1962. But basically, the fabric of space, when everything is absent, that's why they call it zero point. It's zero degrees Kelvin. There's no heat, there's no light, there's no anything. What's left in the fabric of space? Tremendous fluctuations. There are very basically like a virtual plasma. It's just like a cha chaotic plasma. And the question I had to the physics professors when I jumped into this is, can this be tapped as a source? They boom back, no way, it's random, it's chaotic, random things must forever remain random. Therefore, don't waste your time. However, in 1978, Pringagine, Ilya Pringagine wins the Nobel Prize 
in chemistry for showing how a system may evolve from chaos to self-organization. And he established three principles that were described in systems terms that apply to any type of system that exhibits these principles will have the possibility of self-organization. The system must be nonlinear, far from equilibrium, and have an energy flux through it. And that was the key. I said, that describes the quantum foam, the zero-point energy. It has all those characteristics. He's pointing the way of how to tap it. What you do is you work with a highly nonlinear system. You abruptly drive it far from equilibrium with like an abrupt pulse. Plasmas are highly nonlinear. And you max work with the particles who maximize their interaction with the zero-point energy, like the ions. We'll get into that. Using bucking electromagnetic fields gets us into some scalar ideas and stresses on the zero-point energy, which is a topic of another talk. I'll, I'll illustrate these examples are in the literature. Timothy Boyer des the, the, uh, derived it in 1976, previous to Pringagine, uh, showed that the nonlinear oscillator can absorb modes in the zero-point energy. Didn't quite believe it, so 20, whoops, 20 years later, Frank Mee gets the patent. And he, and he uses computer chip technology to make microscopic nonlinear oscillators, and then electric circuits can interact with the beat frequency between them. Eberlein, uh, she's an Oxford professor, but she did a thesis on showing that abrupt motion, any very abrupt motion of matter, activates the zero point energy. Um, and this is the fourth derivative of velocity. That's how abrupt it has to be to do it. And she went on to explain sonoluminescence with this. Sonoluminescence is this mysterious bluish glow that comes when you mix some inert gas with water and you excite it with ultrasonic excitation. It ended up producing an energy amplification of 100 million, somehow 100 billion. Concentrates the ultrasonic energy in, into that. Um, Barber and Putterman showed that it could not come from atomic transitions. A lot of people got excited by sun and luminescence because if you thought it was a uh, thermal characteristic, it would appear to be 40,000 degrees Kelvin if it were thermal. But if it were the vacuum energy, it wouldn't be for that much. So the good news is, Everlin has uh, showed that it could be, that we could be tapping the vacuum energy, but not for that much power. Now, um, my friend Thorsten um, Ludwig, who's here as a speaker, uh, pointed out that, that uh, Eberlein is old school and that there's, uh, there's more to the story on sauna and luminescence. So um, I'll dig into it next year. I'll, I'll update you. What's the best particle to use for uh, activating the vacuum energy? It is not conduction band electrons. They are like a smeared charge cloud. They're effectively in equilibrium with the vacuum energy and the vacuum fluctuations. That's why your normal circuits, your normal everyday um, electronics will not activate the vacuum energy. However, the nucleus, especially in a, in a plasma, it has steep lines of vacuum polarization converging onto the nuclei. And in the literature, they show that this, this is a great coherer of the vacuum energy, and they do the experiments. In the ion collision experiments, they call them exotic coherent vacuum states in quantum electrodynamics. They see the coherence induced by the ion motion. If we work with lots of ions moving synchronously in a, in a plasma, they call it the ion acoustic mode. And it could launch vacuum polarization displacement currents. This is where we're getting our cold current launch from. And their displacement currents, a coherence in the vacuum that hugs the wires, does not in readily induce electron motion in the wires and that can produce the cold current. This is the mode we're looking for. We jerk the ions to move and launch the polarization wave. Do they see the anomalies in the experiments on the ion acoustic mode? They sure do. It's reported in the literature. They see large radiant energy spikes, high frequency spikes, large radiant energy absorption, runaway electrons, anomalous heating, and anomalous plasma resistance. So Morey was working with that. He was working with those plasmas. And Morey stressed the importance of ion motion in the tubes. We're going to take a quick look at the patent and just see the craftsmanship that went into making these tubes. These, were, these tubes are part of the electrotherapeutic apparatus. 
But on the third plate, these three tubes don't fit the apparatus at all, but they do fit the energy device. And we're going to look at these three tubes in detail. But to give you an appreciation of how well more engineers, here's the tube that is part of the electrotherapeutic device. All these sharp points, that's where he puts his corona out. Here's a side view of them. So he has a brush discharge and a dielectric and an inner electrode. And by the way, when Morey says I'm working with a dielectric, you always have to keep in mind he loves to work with radioactive material. And I always think, oh, he could always be mixing radioactive material in with it because it, it can produce some nice effects working inside the dielectric. This plate, figure 14, I believe is the oscillator tube. Paul Brown likewise believed it too because it fits very, very well. Uh, we have uh, these, these, this represents a cylindrical capacitor and the dielectric material is here. And we have the brush discharge electrode and, and the dielectric separator. Uh, what was remarkable about the claim on the, on the oscillator tube itself, he claimed you could, he, Moray was getting a capacitance of one farad while that tube was in operation. This is considered extraordinary and, 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 and literally impossible. It's considered the claim was way beyond belief. Uh, especially for the electrical engineering community, because what was he have? What did he have in here? Powdered quartz. It wasn't even that good of a dielectric material. However, since he loved mixing radioactive material with with dielectrics, you can envision a plasma forming in here, interstitial plasma inside the the, the grain between the grains of, of the dielectric powder, and now you effectively have a plasma dielectric which exhibits extreme polarizability. It's more polarizable than any of the known materials. And then it's thinkable that you could have a one farad tube, a capacitance while the tube was operating. So you can kind of piece the pieces together that the tube itself was effectively, that whole dielectric was, ion, you can envision ion oscillations inside that dielectric while the tube was running it at resonance. These were his valve tubes. It was a tube within a tube. The, this, tube this tube acts as the uh, grid. It controls when the tube will fire, when the valve will fire. Here's the emitter. Here's the plate. And uh, this would be a normal electron acceleration. It would produce x-rays. You'd have an x-ray window to help focus it into the gap, and that would cause a discharge to fire. Had another variation of it where he could use both x rays and UV to help fire the gap. Here we have a reflector and a lens to focus it on the gap. So when he fired the electrons here, he could then cause a plasma discharge in the tube. So he could create pulsing by creating plasma discharge in the tube at will using his valve tubes. So let's put, let's put it together in the circuit. This oscillator, this is an electrical engineering symbol for an oscillator. This is the oscillator tube. Right here, I'm just using that as a symbol. Here are the valve tubes. We're not going to show any control circuitry to gate it. And we have an input capacitor and an output capacitor. And here's how the tube works. Here's how the circuit works. The oscillator is oscillating. Uh, we have charge on the capacitor. And this fires, this valve closes in phase to pulse this oscillator, just like you're pushing a swing, in phase, to gradually build up the amplitude of the oscillations. So we pulse in phase and keeping the resonance of the tube. And it does not necessarily have to be at any single frequency because plasmas are notoriously nonlinear, so the frequency could drift. But all he has to do is, is monitor the, uh, the oscillations in the tube and appropriately time it so that the, these pulses come in phase to gradually grow the amplitude. When they get to a certain size, we use this valve to bleed them off and charge the output capacitor. There are many, many cycles could occur here to gradually charge the output capacitor. And Moray described slowly charging up the output capacitors on a very slow and gradual method, especially on the, on the very last stage. So we can put it together in a multi-stage device. Right? Moray described using three stages. And basically, the high frequency stage gradually builds up on its output capacitor to become the input capacitor on the lower frequency stage. And you can see how you can repeat the pattern. And most of the other tubes probably in the device were control circuitry to get the timing release and the monitoring of this perfectly timed. He was a master corona engineer. So you can imagine that if we had all this ion activity and it was producing these cold current polarization waves throughout the circuit, we could envision building up and surrounding the entire apparatus 
this cold current oscillation, this, this displacement current, all coupled from these vacuum activation from the oscillating of the ions. And Moray was probably the first to stress the importance of oscillating the ions in the tube or in the device, make it the basis of the device. We'll jump over to Korea as they're contemporary. They're doing their work up in, in to, uh, Toronto, Canada, I believe. Uh, I think they'll go down like the Currys in history. It's a husband and wife te team. Alexandra uh, is a tube maker. She actually blows the glass and builds the tubes. And um, Paolo is a marvelous electrical engineer. He has many talents. They're, he's a Wilhelm Reich fan. And it's the studies of the Reich motor that led him to study, that led him to, to the anomalies on the tube. This is the pulse abnormal low discharge circuit. It's designed to be a relaxation oscillator that would discharge the tube and immediately quench it. And the reason why we want to operate there is uh, this is a diagram of, of the voltage versus the, the amps. Where there's a negative resistant region right here where, where the tube has to be operated to be efficient. If you come over here, you go into your normal electrical discharge arc and you have losses. It's just electrical losses and you don't have heating. He says the most important thing is after you hit this discharge point, you have to quench the current and quench the tube and let it recover and build up again. And of course, the front end on any discharge is an EV. So I think it's, this work is very much related to the work of Ken Shoulders. Uh, we have, in the standard literature, we have what they call pseudosparks. They build up a lot of corona and then they abruptly fire it. Um, and they, they use them as switches. But on the front end of these, uh, Ken like to go to the pseudo spark conventions. They have one every year in the power industry to see if anybody recognized any, any anomalies on the front end. They really weren't looking for them. But Ken says they got to be launching an EV every time they pulse one of these things. <coughs> uh, here's one of my heroes because I studied him way early when uh, I first got started. I think it was 1975. In 19, uh, Ed Gray made the pulse capacitor discharge engine. That's what he called it. It ran cold. He could produce torque, uh, plenty of electrical power. He would run batteries. He was foolish in the early years to claim free energy, which got him in trouble with the SEC. Later on, he backed off that claim. Uh, the, the early patent in the 70s described a uh, bucking electromagnetic fields, and we're sparking across to, to the rotor. And then we spark gap. We could have another set of coils right here uh, to, keep, to keep the motor running. You have, uh, it read like he was getting his discharges from the, from the capacitor. And electrical engineers would laugh at this thing. They would scoff at it. Look at all the sparking in the gap. He says, you're a fool. Look at all the, look, look at all the losses and things like that. And, he said, and yet, here he was um, running the device. It would run cold, would not heat up, and it would have, it would have plenty of power. He won Inventor of the Year in 1976, which is a very prestigious award for, for the United States. What I found out later, it was not pulses from the capacitor, but it was pulses from a specially crafted tube that was producing this effect. And he patented it twice, in 1986 and 1987. And the patents were identical. I read them both. And I says, why in the world did he patent it twice? Well, the body and the fi figures were identical. But there was one embellishment on the claim talking about these grids right here. They stress the importance of these grids. These grids are like halocathode grids. We have a spark gap right here. We have an interesting uh, resistive material right here that may be significant because it's inside the tube. So I'm, I'm wondering what that's all about. A strange thing to do. He also used the cascading switch technique, uh, which is not, not shown here. Uh, where he had a, a commutator and, a, and, a, and another switching tube, and finally this spark gap. So he, you could say he had a three-spark a three cascade to fire this tube. Uh, if we look at the details, this is the grid. And we're going to look at the details of the corona in that grid. Here we charge up our anode to high voltage. We have our spark gap here. And what happens is if we can abruptly pulse uh, and release the high voltage from this just for an instant. We, can, we start with a polarized plasma in the grid, and if we can abruptly move, make an abrupt discharge, these ions will converge towards the center as these electrons converge towards the periphery. And you can imagine we could create a compression pulse from that. I'll give a better picture. Here's the way it would look. The ions would compress in. This gets into scalar compression ideas where we're making pressure on the fabric of space. We have a pure cylindrical geometry and we're jerking the ions inward. 
So the trick to, do, to launching this is you have to have a very abrupt unipolar switching. If, if we allow it to oscillate and the ions don't really move, we don't get the big effect. The idea is we launch a polarization wave on the anode itself. And it goes out the grounding end. If we go ahead and just fire the tube, like a normal discharge tube, which is not the mode that Gray recommended, uh, then we would get into uh, a compression of the plasma discharge, like an avalanche discharge, all converging in on, towards the anode. L likewise, would likely be a vacuum energy activator. And in fact, that's just what happens in Eric Lanier's Zeta Pinch device. He's, re he's repeating uh, work done in the, uh, originally in the 50s on the Zeta Pinch fusion device, and he's getting extraordinary temperatures, getting extraordinary energetic activity from this compression discharge. Uh, on his website, you can read about these trying to produce uh, hydrogen boron fusion, which is a clean fusion reaction. We get out three helium, we get no neutrons, no radioactive waste whatsoever. Uh, I was claiming 100 billion degrees Kelvin, and we get outputs directly as electricity. And how in the world do we get outputs as electricity? He shows why. In that device, in the heart of the eye, he's making a big plasmoid. Right, it's like a, f a ball lightning event, the EV. And this has, I think this has the energy, uh, all the energy anomalies of EVs. It's tapping the vacuum energy. Uh, when it decays, it emits electron beams and, and ion beams in opposite directions so he can get an electrical pulse out that he can tap direct, uh, directly as electricity. And I bet you there's a surprise in store because if he works with inert gases and doesn't try for fusion but runs the same device, I bet you he'll see this energy anomalies because I, I believe he's getting it from the vacuum energy. I'd like to acknowledge Peter and Lindemann because I think he did a wonderful job on the investigation of the cold current effect and promoting the gray tube uh, to be, to, for researchers because the gray tube is probably uh, the best of the simple experiments that we could try in the garage uh, to work with all the right ideas. We make the glow plasma and we pulse it. Uh, most investigators are struggling with the pulsing aspect because it's hard to make a unipolar, really, rap, really effective unipolar switch. And Peter stresses the importance of the unipolar event. Uh, Peter also suggested that uh, these canisters in the famous Swiss LML converter, uh, the Testatica machine in Switzerland by the Christian community, it's very famous, um, could likewise be effectively doing what the gray tube does. That's his suggestion. It's not a bad hypothesis. And I, I heard rumors that they're also using some type of cascade switching and a sparking type of sparking switch uh, surrounded by this device. So in summary, what did Morris discover? The most important thing, oscillate the ions in the glow plasma. Work with the ions. He used radioactive material as a catalyst to make the plasma so he didn't have to put any input energy in. And then he would tune the circuit elements to resonance. All the rest is good electrical engineering. And so the engineering pr principles are to, to activate the vacuum energy is abrupt motion of the, of the glow plasma nuclei in the plasma. We, taught, we had the snap back a mode, which, which returns, doesn't really discharge the tube, but launches the polarization wave, which I think is the most efficient of the modes. And the snap apart meant we went ahead and made the full discharge. Uh, experiments could be done with other shapes. We have a cylindrical shape inside that hollow cathode that Gray made, but there's, you could work with Mobius bands or all sorts of other creative ways to work with the plasma. And other inventors have talked about shaping being very significant. Uh, bucking electromagnetic fields and counter-rotation actually relate to each other because what we're doing is in the, we want to, when we make something from the vacuum, we want to work with counter-rotating or counter-angular momentum Exactly opposite because the vacuum likes to produce things in pairs, whether we're working microscopically or inducing a coherence macroscopically. And if you want to read more about it, there, um, we have my books that are out, they're already available. And just this year, it just came out, uh, my new book, uh, The Energy Machine of T. Henry Moray, which is effectively the slideshow with a lot more details and a lot more pictures. Thank you. Well, thank you, Maury. Um, if anyone would like to ask...